Well, good afternoon and welcome along to the Pastors Hard. My name is Dominic Steele. We had a great day here yesterday with the Nexus Conference. We had uh, oh, 300-ish ministers from all over Sydney here and then live streamed to 20 or more locations around the country. It was terrifically exciting to be able to encourage and serve so many fellow ministers of Christ Jesus. Next week on the Pastor's Heart, we're going to be joined by Tony Payne, who was one of the main speakers at yesterday's Nexus conference. And uh, Tony will be talking to us about the issues of every member ministry. He's been thinking a lot about that for the last three years. That's been the main subject of his PhD, and it was the main subject of his addresses. There was lots and lots of questions left over last week, and we're going to be asking him those questions next week, 2 o'clock, Tuesday on The Pastor's Heart, and then, of course, on the podcast after that. Uh, The week after that, we're going to be joined by Sandy Grant. Now, uh, Sandy is the uh, Dean of Wollongong, and they've just had a fantastic thing down in the whole Wollongong area on the south coast of New South Wales. 50 or more churches have been working together in a concentrated month of mission. And then last week, they were joined by... um, theological college students for a whole week and really a concentrated effort in proclaiming Christ and we'll be doing a post-mortem, a debrief with Sandy about that next week. And then the following week, we're going to be joined by David Robertson. He's our first international guest on The Pastor's Heart. He's, he blogs by the name of The We Flee. Uh, and <laughs> why is that his blog title? Because apparently he was in debate with Richard Dawkins online and Dawkins banned him from speaking to him and so blocked him and then um, and called him and John Lennox and a couple of others uh, fleas on a dog's back and uh, anyway David Robertson decided to create a new persona the wee flea because uh, he's a Scottish Presbyterian and uh, and then started re-interacting with Dawkins until he was banned again but he now blogs under that title anyway he'll be our guest in three weeks time today though we turn to the subject of is the pope a catholic we welcome rachel chiano welcome thank you for having me great to have you with us this afternoon thank you now um you're a lecturer at Mm -hmm. sydney missionary and bible college in church history you've been researching this whole area of roman catholicism Mm -hmm. and the nature of uh, well pope francis but Mm -hmm. before we get to that let's talk about the pastor's heart and you as a pastor in your heart and what's a journey that God has led you on and looked after you through? Um, mm. yeah. So a couple of years back, um, my husband and I, we lost two children in utero. And for me, that was a really hard thing and for him as well. And we needed to continue in pastoral mm. ministry in that. Um, but I, I felt it very keenly. I felt as if death lived in me and you grow very attached to mm. them from a young age, even in utero. So it was a great loss for me. I had a wonderful sense through it that God was carrying me each and every day on on the days that I didn't think I could physically face. Um, I had the words of Psalm 121 in my head that it's the Lord that watches over me, that he never sleeps or slumbers. So at the absolute lowest point, physically, emotionally, it was the Lord that was watching over me and carrying me through. So I had a very deep sense of that and we're thankful for the church family who rallied around us and uh, thoughtful Christians who just, I guess to use Job sort of picture, sat in the mud with us and didn't offer quaint perhaps bible verses or or sayings but instead were happy to grieve with us in our loss we found that an immense comfort well let's talk about most helpful and least helpful in terms Mm. of people looking after you sure um simply acknowledging the loss was Mm -hmm. helpful without and stopping before the advice Mm -hmm. was good at that particular time of deep loss the practicalities of helping us care for our child as we went through that process, and I was physically very unwell because of it. Because it's, it's while you were involved in the pastoral ministry. During so pastoral ministry, we had a young child already, and um, and yes, yeah, so her life just had to continue. Mm. And so people that were able to pick up the slack that we uh, were dropping was an immense help to mm. us, and and the people that would. Uh, simply comfort us and pray for us uh, where we were at was mm. was wonderful. Mm. Did you find that, because um, I found this, that mm. um, I don't think I'd really appreciated the Psalms mm. 
mm. until I walk through the valley. Yes, you, just, yes, you know? I, I completely agree. Um, uh, I wrote a chapter in a book last year in Finding Lost Words, talking about why we've dropped off in the practice of lament mm -hmm. uh, in our churches and trying to reclaim it, trying to sing them, pray them, preach them, and so on and so forth. And as I thought through that, I thought, yes, we really have lost the art of sitting with lament, uh, often the Psalms, mm -hmm. and, and there's other Psalms that speak not just to lament, uh, but they were a wonderful comfort mm. in the valley, and that's why they're written. They're, the, they're mm. the songbook of Israel, the songbook of Christians, the songbook of the heart. Mm. Mm. Now, um, if you're watching along with us uh, on the Pastor's Heart, uh, we can tell you that um, uh, it's possible for you to interact, to ask a question. Uh, you just go to the, the Facebook page, and then you make a comment, ask a question on that page, and then we'll pull it up and uh, be able to put that question uh, to Rachel as we go through this 30 minutes. Let's start off, Rachel, with mm. just the big clear question, is the Pope a Catholic? <laughs> is the Pope Catholic? That is the question that lots of people are asking. It's incredible that people are asking. I mean, it used to be just a joke. Yes, you, yes. Say, is it was the one, that I, didn't, it, one it, that I didn't get as a young yeah. child, grew up in a non-Christian family, so I had no idea. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, so it used to be an easy thing to conclude, uh, but both Protestants and Catholics are somewhat confused about the things that Pope Francis um, is doing and saying. And so, yes, some are wondering, is he still fitting within the Roman Catholic system and framework and, uh, and belief? And what particularly is he saying that has got people wondering that? Sure. So he says some things like, uh, Martin Luther did not err. I think perhaps we might have a quote yeah, to we'll that extent. Yeah, put that quote up, quote up on the screen. Um, so yeah. he says he's trying to downplay, one of the things he's trying to do is downplay the significance of the Reformation, essentially mm -hmm. concluding that it's over, that Martin Luther did not err, and that Protestants and Catholics now agree on the doctrine of justification, which of course was a great Reformation doctrine. Now when he says Martin Luther does not err, mm. is he speaking, this is my Francis's personal view, or is he speaking more broadly, this is an official position of the church? That's a really good question. Uh, he spoke those particular words in an in-flight press conference. Mm -hmm. He's on planes a lot, so he gives press conferences on planes mm -hmm. a lot. Um, so it's hard to say whether that's ex cathedra, uh, you know, infallible, mm -hmm. but certainly it's his position and I think definitely reflects the wider position or the agenda that he's trying to shape within the Catholic Church to um, bring agreement between Protestants and Catholics um, on things like key doctrines like justification. Now, he's, he's meaning it, when he says Luther did not err, mm. he, he's meaning it speaking specifically to the issue of justification. Justification in that so, particular area. I mean, yep. Luther wrote so much yes. and called the Pope an antichrist. Yes, and I guess yes he's, he's, not he's probably not agreeing with that. With that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay. Um, well, well, let's just talk about the man, Francis, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. a minute. Tell us about the man. Yeah. Sure, sure. So uh, Pope Francis is a wonderful breath of fresh air in mm -hmm. the Catholic Church. He's very warm and affable, he's personable, he's got a Twitter mm -hmm. account. He um, And is it him that does the Twitter account? Or I think so, judging by what I'm reading or okay. someone on his behalf, but yes, you can follow him on Twitter yeah. um, and get a flavour for what he's like. But I think there's three core identities that mm -hmm. really paint the picture of who he you, is. I haven't looked. Does he yeah. follow soccer or anything on his Twitter account? Does he, or is he just speaking I think he just sticks to officialdom, but I haven't <laughs> scrolled. There's a lot there. You, could, you can scroll through. Um, so uh, he is a Jesuit, mm -hmm. which is the first pope from the order of the Jesuits mm -hmm. in history. So what that means, I think, on the ground is uh, the Jesuits were trying to call Protestants back uh, mm -hmm. to the Catholic Church during I mean, the Counter-Reformation. the missions of the Jesuits, yeah. Yes, yes, they were a key part of the Catholic Counter-Reformation in the 16th century. And um, they So therefore, are you saying that it's a key mission of Francis to call Protestants back to Catholicism? And you were saying, on the one hand, he says Luther didn't err, but on the other mm. hand, I want you to come back. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's a tricky one, isn't it? So... I think when he's trying to call them back, it's post-Vatican II, and mm -hmm. he is a child of post-Vatican mm -hmm. II. He's the first pope to really embody um, the things that came out of that very important church council, the last church council. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no more kind of in and out and separated brethren and mm -hmm. so on. It's much more uh, communal, and the emphasis has gone to the Catholic 
arm of the Roman Catholic Church, the embrace, the inclusion. And so it's trying to include Protestants in perhaps as a wing of the Catholic Church, although that wouldn't be officially the position, but they're trying to make space, I think, within the Catholic Church for Protestants to find a home if they wish, mm -hmm. and also perhaps for uh, Catholics who um, want a more evangelical experience within the Church to not be tempted to leave the Roman Catholic Church, but to be able to have that evangelical experience while remaining within the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So it's one of embrace. Let's take a little digression from Francis mm. just onto these two terms, Roman and Catholic, mm -hmm. because they're the terms that are used. Mm -hmm. But I think you're saying that you can actually look at the characteristics of Roman and the characteristics of Catholic mm. and say some quite significant things about those two areas. Mm. Do you want to just kind of elaborate sure, for that? Sure, sure. So uh, the Roman Catholic Church is always Roman and always Catholic. It's both at the same time, but it does seem to swing in its emphases. So the Roman element is the imperial, more dogmatic, um, that's centred on Rome. It's not kind of relativistic and pluralistic. It centres on a place. It's about uh, dogma, what is uh, in and out. It's, um, the it's seeing the Roman Catholic Church as the historical continuity of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. much. And so who that's would be the in. popes that we'd particularly see as... So um, I think the last pope, Pope Benedict. Pope Benedict, yep. yep. Ratzinger. Yep. Yeah, Cardinal Ratzinger. Yes, he was certainly very Roman. Mm -hmm. um, he was the theological advisor mm. for, um, uh, yeah, in the papacy. Um, and then it seems that now we have swung to the Catholic, the embracing, the universal element of the Catholic Church, uh, which is much more warm, accommodating. There's not so much in or out, right or wrong, black or white. Um, you see that you, that's reflected definitely in Francis's embrace. Yeah, speech. Yes. Where would you see, theologically, someone like George Pell sitting on that Roman to Catholic spectrum? Mm, that's a really good question. I'd need to be better acquainted with the theology of George Pell. I only mm -hmm. have a scattered understanding, mm. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll just... Mm. No, I, please, I you no, probably no, have that already. Well, I'll just make a completely uninformed comment. I reckon... It feels to me like he's swung. He's kind okay. of. Sw I mean, this this is completely uninformed. Com mm, could be no, completely no, no. wrong. What do you but see? it feels to me like <laughs> when the winds of change were in the Roman direction. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. he was there, and, mm -hmm. and I mean, you actually felt like he was kind of. Um, you had Benedict. You had. And he was mm. one of the influential yes. guys in his court, and then as the court has moved to be more Catholic and away from Roman, well, he's certainly been in Francis's court. Okay. Do you know, I, I think that but, fits. If that's your observation, yeah, I think but, that that fits. Yes. But I'm, I'm speaking. So yes, it's, po it's possible to swing, but you're still both at the same time, yeah. not letting go of one uh, when you have swung to the mm. other. It's both. It's important to say they're both at the same time. Mm. Now we're looking forward to you asking a question. If you want to hop onto the Facebook and. Uh, and ask a question. We've got one in from Tim Stevens, mm -hmm. and uh, um, he's well. He's just a, sort of an observation from mm. Tim that where he ministers, and uh, Tim's up in Mungandai in northwest New South Wales. Mm -hmm. um, the only other church is a Catholic one, and it's helped him to think us think this through as he works out where to part with, partner with them, where not to. Sure. Let's go back to that um, that earlier issue because before we got on to Roman and Catholic yes we were on Francis yes. and you said Jesuit so it's Jesuit so that's a very key identity his other two key identities um, I would say is that he's chosen the name Francis he's Franciscan mm -hmm. he's the first Pope to choose that name mm -hmm. so that's very significant and Francis modeled on Francis of Assisi uh, who typified poverty mm -hmm. humility care for the poor and so on mm -hmm. And also important in Francis of Assisi is that he wanted to bring reform from within the church without confronting the church. So it's mm -hmm. a reform with, that doesn't directly challenge the church, mm -hmm. but by lifestyle. So I think evangelical poverty summarizes the spirituality of Pope Francis. Mm -hmm. So we have Jesuit, we have Franciscan, and then the last thing is that he's South American. That's mm -hmm. also really important. Mm -hmm. Most popes in history have come from within Europe. There's not many from without outside Europe mm -hmm. at all. Uh, and this is the first one from South America. It was deliberately chosen by the papal conclave, mm -hmm. conclave the College of Cardinals, um, because he embodied the continent in which uh, they see the future of Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And he embodies the wonderful tendencies of South Americans. He's warm, he's personable, he can live in community. Mm -hmm. um, he identifies and you, and you hear, with the people very well. Not so much being up in the kind of 
papal no, place, but no. having coffee Humility, and Humility, evangelical yeah. poverty, yes. So he's very much speaking the language of the um, progressive West mm -hmm. and the global South. Refugees, migrants, care of the poor, care of the environment. Do you think the church has lost or, or, or shifted mission then mm. from saving souls to caring for poor? Well, that's a really good question. Um, and even beyond caring for poor, caring for the environment. Mm -hmm. So, Because that was it, he put out an encyclical on that. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, which operates at kind of the highest level of mm -hmm. authority as mm -hmm. magisterium. Um, yes, so Laudato Si, praise be to you, in 2015, just before mm -hmm. the Paris climate change, it mm -hmm. came out and was significantly discussed in Paris. Mm -hmm. Every head of state that comes to the Vatican to meet the Pope gets a copy of this. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's political, it's environmental, it's all, uh, all at the same time and spiritual. And it is elevating the work of caring for the environment um, to that of the general term of mission, mm -hmm. maybe even more important <clears throat> than proclamation with words. What then is Francis's relationship with evangelicals? Because mm. my impression is when he was a bishop back in South America, mm -hmm. he was quite good friends with a number yeah. of evangelical. I mean, yeah. I remember one of my friends, um, I, I remember talking to him on Facebook about the fact that... Um, well, he, I mean, he clearly knew Francis mm. quite well mm. from ministers' fraternal meetings yes, and that kind yes. of thing. Yes, yeah. he's very good at engaging with evangelical ministers. He he has them to the Vatican. He was friends with them in South America, mm -hmm. and part of that South American warm embrace tone mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. translates to that. So he's he embraces them. Mm -hmm. He gives them high fives. He's very warm, and he's happy for the dialogue. That's part of the swing to Catholic mm -hmm. is dialogue, mm -hmm. and so uh, very good at dialogue, um, and. Uh, evangelical pastors are saying that when they go to the Vatican, instead of kind of the infighting that they're used to at their particular pastoral meetings, mm -hmm. uh, they're embraced and they're, and they're loving it. So he's very good at engaging with them. He's also very good at using evangelical language, things that resonate. We might differ on the meaning, but he'll use terms like um, mission, gospel, conversion, Evangelism. But he'll mean different things. Yes, yes. We mean different things on a whole lot of words. Okay. They're just some. Well, let's come around to that in a moment. But first, how are evangelicals responding to this mm. and how should they respond to this? So, uh, in the past, there's been a range of um, responses. I think largely they fall into a um, polemical approach. You know, we we don't like this, we mm -hmm. do like this, so be, mm -hmm. you know, combative. Um, and that often falls into, um, I guess, a piecemeal approach mm -hmm. where we just, we agree on, say, the doctrine of the Trinity or the doctrine of creation, but we disagree on perhaps Roll purgatory Mary or, or Mary or, or so on and so forth. And so we tend to carve have, have up... A, have a debate about yeah. role of Mary, a debate about... Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the other large approach, I would say, is a peacemaking one where we try and find common ground. Um, uh, where we can agree and that and those statements on uh, justification uh, find themselves into documents that are co-signed by uh, the Vatican and say the World Council of Lutheran Churches uh, and they write documents where they agree on justification mm -hmm. um, so it's that kind of peacemaking approach. Now my observation mm. as a former Roman Catholic is that my Protestant friends who are less familiar mm -hmm. with the Roman Church mm. often are looking for, well, where do we agree? Mm. And not actually thinking through the serious issues where we disagree. Mm -hmm. and, and also are likely to get distracted into, well, having a debate about purgatory or having a debate about Mary sure. or something like that. Sure. Rather than actually talking about the key issue, which is how can you be right with God? Do mm. you know, how, mm -hmm. what does grace look like? Mm. And so can you talk to me about... Um, perhaps a constructive way forward mm. for evangelicals relating with Roman Catholic friends. Sure. Yeah. So I think it's really important and we, we seek to engage with mm -hmm. our Roman Catholic friends and neighbours mm -hmm. and workmates and I'm married to a man who used to be mm -hmm. Catholic mm -hmm. um, so we live it and we breathe it. And I mean and you're uh, ministering in Marrickville. Marrickville is the which third is, Catholic. Yeah. Yep, so our, uh, most of our neighbours are Catholic and so we're... And often Catholic by migrants, migrants as well. In your yes, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yep. So um, 
it's important to look at Catholicism as a system because then we can adequately mm -hmm. address uh, mm -hmm. the issues like purgatory and Mary and mm -hmm. so on and that are coming up. It's a really helpful system that I've been learning about. I've piggybacked off some people in Rome for this. They're called mm -hmm. the Rome Scholars Network. Mm -hmm. They try and get evangelicals to be able to engage in thinking critically and carefully about Roman Catholicism. Um, so what I've learnt from uh, spending time in Rome with them is um, a kind of a paradigm mm -hmm. that I think is helpful and I would call it the nature-grace interconnection. So nature and grace are very mm -hmm. connected in the Roman Catholic system and Christ and the church are also interconnected. Mm -hmm. So the first one, nature and grace, and we can see it up there. You've given us a diagram. We've given now, us a diagram. Now for the people listening on audio, mm -hmm. this won't be much use to them, so uh, this diagram... Just keep listening to the words <laughs> and hopefully it'll make sense. <laughs> so for, for Catholics, nature is able to, I guess, hold grace and communicate grace. It can infuse grace. So mm -hmm. nature is anything that God has created. Mm -hmm. Oil, water, rocks, earth, people mm -hmm. um, can receive and communicate grace. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of uh, grace, it is something more of an infusion idea. It's not quite a substance, but it's close to a substance. So mm -hmm. let me give you an example, because mm -hmm. that seems a bit abstract. Um, so say at, uh, in the Eucharist, uh, the priest will call on the Father to send the Holy Spirit and transubstantiate the substances of bread and wine mm -hmm. uh, into the body and blood of Jesus. And so there you are infusing a physical nature, something from nature, mm -hmm. with grace, and that grace can then be infused into the recipient of the Eucharist. So and it's it, the church. And it is the church that connects that controls them. whether or not you get the grace. Well, there's that. Yes. So they are. They connect. There's a continuation of almost Christ's incarnation in the Roman Catholic Church. So they are the ones that can mediate between grace and nature. Mm -hmm. Okay. Give me the contrast. Give me the Protestant view. In the Protestant view. So we would say that grace is an inward transformation, mm -hmm. that it's not external. It's nothing that we can take into us that allows us to be more right with God. Mm -hmm. Our idea of grace as well, and it's very much linked to justification, is a declaration. We would say justification is a declaration that we are no longer guilty but we are uh, declared innocent because Christ's righteousness is counted for our righteousness. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a once for all event and then we continue to live our lives in thankfulness mm -hmm. for that event. In the Catholic system, justification and sanctification are infused. So you are justified as you are sanctified, as you are deified, as you are made more and more like God. And so, um, yes, original sin is cleansed at baptism within the Roman Catholic Church, but you will need to continue to receive from the Roman Catholic Church the sacraments which infuse grace into you that will continue the process of sanctification so that hopefully at the end of your life you will be in a fit enough state to enter heaven. And of course, if you're not quite there, if you haven't quite been deified enough, um, then purgatory is able to make up um, the process of, I guess, purification that you need before you can enter heaven. Mm -hmm. So it's very different ideas mm. on grace. We would say it's a once for all declaration, do sort of thing. Uh, sorry, done. Uh, whereas in the Roman Catholic system, it's a, it's a continual doing. It's continual infusing of grace, continual uh, process of justification, of sanctification, of deification, so that hopefully at the end of our lives, we are fit enough to see God face to face. So how might it play out? I mean, what if, mm. what if I was me and you were Francis? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just trying to think about how we could role play the conversation in okay. terms of... Um, uh, so, so Francis, mm. I, I just feel worried that you've l changed the Bible's view from what I think grace is mm. in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Mm. Because I think it's, for it's by grace you've been saved, not by works, mm -hmm. so no man can boast. Do you mm -hmm. know? But you seem to be saying something different, mm. are you? Mm. 
speaking as Francis. <laughs> Rather um, than speaking as the SMBC make lecturer. That really clear. <laughs> SMBC would not be happy with what's about to come out of my mouth. Um, we'll make so it into a meme. Because and put it on. That's <laughs> <laughs> don't cut and edit this, so it's just me speaking now. So. Um, that's because you are not having the scriptures interpreted by the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. You need to have um, the magisterium to help interpret those sorts of scriptures for you. And of course, along with scripture, you will need to also um, hold um, as equal authority the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church, the, the uh, spoken but not written down um, doctrines that have been passed along faithfully from Jesus uh, to his disciples, the first apostles mm -hmm. who then founded their churches and of course chief is Peter in Rome. So we have that ongoing tradition that we need to listen to on grace and, um, and of course you need the magisterium, you need the teaching office of the church to help you understand the Bible. So I, so I, I don't think you should um, simply trust what you're reading in Ephesians. Right, I mean we could play out the next round of the we conversation. Could play out I could for a long time. Back, and maybe and maybe I haven't done a good job of Francis there. That would be the official Roman Catholic mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. And and possibly his as well, but he is very conciliatory and warm. Mm -hmm. So he might have landed actually he might have landed on um, terms that we hold together like Grace mm -hmm. and said um, something like, Yes, we do agree on, on mm -hmm. Grace, but actually we're not defining mm -hmm. them. So really you can only say we agree on Luther or Luther was right, if I don't look too much underneath the surface. You know? Sure, yeah. almost if there's a rereading of history, can mm. you say Luther did not err on justification? It was very clear. The Council of Trent, which came so after about 30 years an after, yeah. yes, it was quite strongly worded um, against um, the things that Luther was trying to reintroduce in the church. Luther would not be wanting to be seen as novel. Mm. He didn't at all. That's, he went back to the scriptures and the early church fathers mm. to show that his teaching was in continuity with the Bible and the early church. Actually, you've got a diagram which will yes. pop up on the screen showing the two different views, the Catholic view of what's happened in history and the mm. Protestant view mm. of what's happened on history. Do you just want to explain that, that logic to us there? Sure. So starting uh, post-resurrection, the establishment and birth of the church, the Catholic Church's view of history is that they are in direct continuity, in apostolic continuity with the early church because, of course, Peter, the first bishop of Rome, and his successors, the popes, give us a direct link back to the early church. And they would view uh, Protestants as diverging very sharply in the 16th century, mm -hmm. whereas Protestants would tend to think that the uh, Roman Catholic, or the wasn't called Roman Catholic Church to start with, but the Catholic Church, there was only one, started out fairly well, and over time started to dip, 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 mm -hmm. until uh, where they were was not where the scriptures were. So the reformers were simply trying to get back to the, um, the scriptures, and the early church fathers who were helping to interpret and understand the scriptures. And so they would say that they are in continuity with the early church mm -hmm. because their faith is an apostolic faith. Mm. One last question. Mm. Have you got a crystal ball? What's going to happen in terms of the Roman church going forward? Sure, that's a, um, a good question. So because uh, Pope Francis elected fairly late in his life, mm -hmm. the laws of nature say that he cannot be here mm. forever. So we don't know whether the change that he's taking is going to stick. We certainly know that he's trying to make appointments into the College of Cardinals mm -hmm. uh, of like-minded bishops and mm -hmm. they, will, of course, will elect the next Pope. So it, it could turn that way, mm -hmm. um, but we simply don't know. But it does tend to shift every generation or so between an emphasis on Roman and an emphasis on Catholic. Mm. So I simply don't know. <laughs> My guest has been Rachel Chiano on The Pastor's Heart. Thanks very much for You're being welcome. with us, Rachel. Thank you for having me. Now, next week, we've got uh, 2 o'clock Tuesday, we've got Tony Payne joining us. Uh, of course, he's uh, the uh, founder, publisher, editor of Matthias Media and been doing this PhD on every member ministry. Uh, he was the speaker last week or yesterday at the, uh, the Nexus Conference. Uh, well, actually, in the notes for here, put up... Um, uh, some of the uh, the links to those talks, really helpful addresses by Tony, and we'll be putting some questions to him on how every member word ministry, not so much the, the, 
the word ministry that the preacher does, but the word ministry of the membership of the church, how that can look according to the New Testament. And uh, we'll look forward to you joining us next week on The Pastor's Heart. Thanks very much for being with us this afternoon.